Um, so I was asked to, to give a general purpose talk essentially on, on the different research lines that, that I'm doing, okay? And um, as many of you, of you know, uh, I've been working many things. I've been working on simulation methods for quantum many body systems. I've also been working on, on quantum technologies, on quantum algorithms. And I've also been doing uh, other stuff. I remember giving a talk about linguistics in this in this room a couple of, of years ago, actually. So uh, what I want to give you is an overview of all this. Okay, what am I doing now? Uh, what type of things I, I think that they are interesting and, uh, and what type of things I would like to keep continue working on the future. Okay, so I don't have time. I don't have time, unfortunately, to go through all the projects that uh, uh, I'm working on, uh, we are working on uh, at my group, okay? But uh, but I want to give you a glimpse at least of um, a couple of, of projects, okay? Actually, few projects, right? That um, we've been working on uh, during the last years, okay? And then you can get more or less an idea of what, of what are the different research lines, okay? So uh, please stop me to ask uh, questions. Uh, don't be shy, okay? Also the people in Zoom that I guess they can see me, okay? You can also, uh, well, you can also tell guests uh, that you have questions. Okay, let's first talk about uh, my research. Uh, one can essentially um, divide it into three different areas. The first one is about tensor network simulations for quantum matter. This is about the strongly correlated systems simulating quantum phases of matter, okay? Quantum many body entanglement. So this has to do with uh, tensor, you know, with with the behavior of entanglement in quantum states of matter, okay? And what is the structure that emerges for quantum states of matter out of, of this entanglement, okay? It's something called a tensor network. And then with these tensor networks, we can build numerical algorithms for simulating quantum many body systems with more accuracy, for instance, than with Monte Carlo simulations, with perturbative continuity, with per cities expansions, and so on and so forth. So that's one of my line of research, okay? Everything that has to do with quantum states of matter and also with tensor networks, both in theory and also from the numerical point of view. Now, the second one is perhaps the one that is uh, more active right now, is about quantum computing and uh, applications, okay? This is the one that has to do with, as guess I was saying, with this startup that I, I just, just built. Um, it's about, uh, you know, research on quantum algorithms, okay? on quantum technologies as a whole, and also about a, a finding and trying to understand what are the applications that we can find that are useful uh, in industry today, okay, with the quantum processors that we, we are starting to have. So, you know, we have these quantum processors. Yesterday, we had a talk by, by Dario Hill, the research director from IBM. He was saying that now we have 127 qubits. Well, they have at IBM, and they, their plan for this year is to have uh, 400 something, and next year they want to have 1,000. So, that's uh, that's a lot, okay. And but even though it's not still one million qubits, no. So the point is, well, what can we do with these machines? That they are small, they are noisy, you know, they are bumpy. <laughs> what type of algorithms can we run, and what type of applications can we can we start to find, okay, that are useful for people outside, let's say, the scientific world, okay? So if you go to a bank, they have their own problems. If you have, if you go to an energy provider, they have their own problems, and so on. So how can we use the machines that we have today? The third one is actually the one that I like the most, which I, I call it exotic explorations. Um, essentially, is anything that doesn't fit on the two um, on the two above, or, or at least anything that doesn't obviously fit right there. So I was telling you that a um, couple of years ago, I, I gave you a seminar about uh, linguistics and renormalization. Some of you were actually here. That will fit perfectly in this in this third class of of topics. Um, um, but there are many other things. For instance, we recently um, uh, understood how to use spin systems to, to do a trend detection. It's a new type of uh, you know, uh, machine learning algorithm, and we applied it actually to political forecasting. Gesa knows a little bit about this because he was involved. Uh, he was there the, at the moment that this idea was actually born. Okay. So um, I call that exotic explorations. And here I would like to, well, in this talk, I will also explain you a little bit about some, some of these ideas. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk, very simple. Um, there is one point for each one of these three lines that I just told you, okay? First, I want to explain about tensor networks, a bit of basics, okay? What is this idea about? And then about a particular project that we uh, <coughs> have been working um, with uh, Said, who was uh, my postdoc here until last year, which is about, well, a condensed matter problem that is called everything covered by quantum and different magnet. 
And the second one is about quantum computing, right? And quantum algorithms. And uh, I want to explain you essentially what are the perspectives on the field and also a particular application also in industry, okay? Which is portfolio optimization, okay? That's an app a financial application. And last but not least, this exotic exploration that I was explaining, you forecasting elections with the spin systems, which is actually a very nice and funny application, not so obvious, and which turns out to have some deep uh, implications in, in artificial intelligence, okay? Good. Well, let's move on. Let's start with tensor networks. Um, the idea of tensor networks always starts when you want to study uh, a system uh, with quantum particles, okay? And you have many, many particles. And then you have a Hamiltonian. You want to understand the ground state of this Hamiltonian, and you want to understand how is the structure of this ground state, okay? Then you realize, when you analyze, when you look at this problem with, with you know, with eyes of quantum information, that the uh, Hilbert space is actually a very large place. It's actually far too large, right? There are some people that they, that even say that the Hilbert space is a convenient illusion, okay? And I want to picture it like, like this. So imagine that the Hilbert space is like this huge space of states. You have exponentially many states right there for a you know for a quantum many body system with with um, particles. Okay. Now it turns out that the set of product states, namely those that are not entangled, they are just a tiny small corner of, of this Hilbert space, exponentially small. Okay. And now it turns out that the set of states that satisfy something called the area law for the entanglement entropy, which is a particular property of, of ground states of local quantum Hamiltonians, is, well, you know, it's larger than the set of uh, product states, but it's actually not so large. Actually, when, when you try to measure the size of that, you realize that it's a set of measure zero. As you increase the size of the system, the overall size of your Hilbert space is growing much faster than the size of, of that small corner, okay? Now, there is something called the set of tensor network states, which I will explain in a second what this is, but this is essentially, essentially low energy eigenstates of local Hamiltonians that is in between here, okay? And all these small corners here, they are exponentially small. So what I want to explain you with this picture is that when you have a quantum many body system, the Hilbert space is huge, huge. But the relevant corner of the Hilbert space at low energies is exponentially small. It's actually, of zero measure, it's it's tiny, okay? It's something super small. Actually, the situation is even worse. So it was proven already like 11 years ago or so that even most of the states here in the rest of the Hilbert space, you cannot reach them by time evolution with a local Hamiltonian, which is a typical thing that, you know, nature can do, let's say, no? So, you know, you're only exploring, you know, something around here, okay? Now, if you put some numbers here, you say, well, a many body system, how many particles do we have? So something of the order of the Avogadro number, let's say 10 to the 23. Then the exploration time goes like 10 to the 10 to the 23. And if you compare it to the age of the universe, which is of the order of 10 to the 17 seconds, you see that you will need exponentially many times the age of the universe to explore the full Hilbert space of a quantum many body system. Okay, that's, that's a lot, no? Well, what this is telling you is that well, there is a problem here. If you want to study a quantum many body system at low energies, you don't need to focus on the full Hilbert space. It will be like, like, like you know, like killing flies with, with cannonballs, okay? Uh, what you have to do is to focus and target the relevant corner of the states that is down here, okay? And that's exactly what, what tensor networks try to do. We need a language to target this relevant corner down here. And that's the idea of tensor networks. So tensor networks, are the compositions of quantum many body states using tensors, okay? I'm gonna be using this diagrammatic notation that we can see here. So I'm gonna be representing tensors uh, by shapes, in this case, by balls, like, like this one, no? And the indices in the tensors are gonna be uh, lines, right? And every time that there is one line that goes from one tensor to another, we say that it's a contracted tensor. It's a common index, okay, between the two tensors, and there is a sum over all the possible values. So it's like a contraction, you know, like, like you know, the sum over the indices of a tensor in, in general relativity, let's say. Now, the indices that are not contracted or they are just here, they, we call that open indices. And then, you know, they are just an index that can take any value, all right? So for instance, this is the diagrammatic representation of the product of two matrices, okay? That's exactly how it will be represented using tensor network diagrams. 
Now I'm going to be using this diagrammatic notation because it helps a lot. Because otherwise, you know, these tensor networks uh, start to be very complicated. And the idea of tensor networks is to pick up the coefficient of the many-body wave function, all right, in a given local basis. And you know, for instance, for nine particles, we see that this is nothing but a tensor with with nine indices, okay. And this is a huge tensor. It has many many parameters. So. If I have here nine spins one half, for instance, the number of parameters inside here is two to the nine. Okay, but if I had uh, 100, it would be two to the 100, and it does, this doesn't fit in the memory of, of anywhere. Okay, so the whole point of tensor networks is to find a cheaper and more efficient decomposition of this big tensor that is actually the coefficient of the quantum state. Okay, there are different ways of decomposing this depending on what is what this quantum state is actually coming from. Okay. One possibility is to decompose it as a matrix product state. This is um, a very well-known tensor network. It's a one-dimensional array of, of tensors, okay, essentially. Um, and it's actually at the basis of um, several numerical methods that are very, uh, you know, very powerful and also very well-known, uh, most prominently DMRG, density matrix normalization group. It's nothing but a variational method over this family of, of quantum states, okay? Um, here in the tensor network, there are different ingredients. Of course, you see the tensors, there are different types of, of indices also. There are the physical indices that correspond to the local Hilbert spaces that you have originally in the quantum state. And then there are some new indices that we just introduced here that they don't exist at the beginning that we call bond indices that are the ones that actually connecting the whole network of tensors, okay? Now, having a look into more detail, into what these bond indices actually represent, one can prove that they are related to the entanglement in the wave function. So they go up to a parameter that is called capital D. And this capital D is actually a measure of entanglement in the quantum state that you have. Okay, so there is a full theory behind this, okay, on how to characterize entanglement. And it has to do with these bond indices that we are introducing here. Now, this is not the only option, of course. Um, there are other possibilities for tensor networks. There are the two-dimensional generalizations of matrix product states, and these are called uh, PEPs or projected entangled pair states. And in some old references, they also call it uh, tensor product states. You can see here uh, PEPs for a three times three square lattice. And there are lots of um, <coughs> numerical methods also based on this family of states, you know, PEPs and IPEPs algorithms, HotRG, TRG, SRG, and so on. You can be here as creative as you want, because depending on what is the entanglement structure and the amount of entanglement in the quantum state that you want to simulate, um, well, the state is going to have one tensor network structure or another. Okay. Um, here is an example of one that is very useful for critical systems. It's called the multi-scale multi entanglement renormalization ansatz, or MERA. I will not too go too much into the details of this. The whole idea of this, of this uh, tensor network is that, you know, there is an extra holographic dimension that corresponds to a renormalization group scale. And it has some very nice connections to actually quantum gravity. So for the people here doing cosmology and so on, their string theory uh, colleagues, uh, maybe at some point they, they just told them about, well, you know, there is this correspondence between ADS, CFT, and all that. Well, it turns out that the meta is very deeply connected also to, to that, okay? So it's nice that we're actually, we are talking about quantum many body systems here, but one can also find uh, results for quantum gravity, no? Now, why are we doing all this? Well, for many reasons, but in particular, because if you count the number of parameters in all these structures, um, you sit down and just do the counting, you will convince yourself very quickly that these are actually efficient descriptions of the quantum many body state. They have a polynomial number of parameters in the number of particles. It's just the sum of the parameters for each one of the tensors, okay? And the number of tensors is polynomial, so that's it, okay? Not only that, but they also satisfy this area law for the entanglement entropy, which is a property that has to be fulfilled. And there are mathematical proofs that they also correspond to low energy eigenstates of local Hamiltonians, okay? Which is what, uh, what we find in nature. Good. Now, <coughs> in the last years, there has been kind of an explosion of, of tensor networks. Essentially, anywhere um, where there is some a correlated set of variables, people have found some tensor network structure behind, okay? So there have been applications in, in many places. Of course, we started with a strongly correlated systems, okay? And studying quantum entanglement in, in, in low energy wave functions, but also people in classical statistical mechanics have been using tensor networks for a while. There are all the results from Baxter from 68 on exactly solvable models and so on. All that is also tensor networks. 
the people in mathematics um, for doing numerical tensor calculus in artificial intelligence, even in linguistics, but in artificial intelligence, there are new um, machine learning algorithms that are actually uh, based on tensor networks. There are, there are also ways of improving the memory of neural networks, okay, by almost by an exponential factor using tensor networks, okay. In finance, in material science, in quantum chemistry and nuclear physics, people have been using DMRZ a lot to validate also quantum simulations in quantum information computation, for sure. In high energy physics, the people are using these, the numerical methods based on these type of states to actually uh, simulate lattice gauge theories, okay? Precisely in those regimes where quantum Monte Carlo is, is not working, where you have fermions, you know, when you want to do time evolution and so on. And as I was saying, also in quantum gravity and the strict theory, there is a very nice connection between <coughs> tensor networks, entanglement, and the holographic principle and ADS theory. So every time I give this talk, I have to update this slide because somebody has found uh, one new application. Okay, good. Now, let me explain you about a problem that we solve using tensor networks, okay, as an example, which is the breathing Kagome antiferromagnet. This is uh, the problem of finding the ground state of this Hamiltonian, okay, where we have a spin one half, uh, spins one half on the Kagome lattice, right? And they are sitting on the vertices of the Kagome lattice. So these are, you know, these are total spin operators. So these are Heisenberg interactions, spin and spin, all right? And now the Kagome lattice is this one here. You can understand it as a lattice of, of corner sharing triangles. You have triangles pointing up and also have triangles pointing down, all right? And finding the ground state when the coupling for the up triangles and down triangles is the same, it's one of the hardest problems in, in condensed matter physics. It was solved, well, it's believed to be solved using DMRZ uh, some years ago. Um, but now the point is what happens if we put different couplings? This is called the breathing, the breathing Kagomati ferroma. Now there are different reasons for uh, for um, uh, for wanting to, you know, for willing to understand what happens when you have different couplings. The first one is that if you go to nature, uh, these carbon compounds are typically anisotropic. So up and down triangles, they don't have the same, the same, the same coupling. Typically, there is also candidate material right here. This has been seen uh, already in several places. And now there is a more theoretical and fundamental question, which is, well, what happens if I just start, you know, having different parameters here? Can I have a phase transition? Can I have a quantum phase transition? What type of phases do I have? What type of criticality does it show up? And so on and so forth, okay? Is there a quantum spin liquid, okay? Which is a particular type of, of phase of matter and so on. Now, experimentally, people have seen that at this value of the anisotropy, there are some signatures of a quantum spin liquid. So a quantum spin liquid is a phase of matter that doesn't break any of the symmetries of the Hamiltonian, okay? It's very special because Landau theory tells you that there is symmetry breaking and this is a, a completely quantum effect, okay? So there are some hints that at this, at this point there may be actually a quantum spin liquid and the point is whether there is a phase transition between a spin liquid, quantum spin liquid phase and something else. So we started this um, with Said. We started in the isotropic limit. As I was telling you, this is one of the hardest problems in computational physics. And here are some numerical results. Of course, here the people have proposed many different things for the ground state using DMRZ, using PEPs, using variational Monte Carlo, and so on. Some people propose a U1 quantum spin liquid. Some other people propose a Z2 quantum spin liquid, and so on. Our simulations are here, okay, together with data from other, from other papers. Um, the ones that work better for us are the ones Exactly these ones here, okay, which correspond to a particular type of tensor network that is two dimensional, it's called PESS, it's very similar to PEPS, using a technique that is called corner transfer matrix renormalization group, okay, and up to uh, a bond dimension, which is our variational parameter here of 30. So we get an energy that goes down a lot, it's pretty much compatible with the one that we see from DMRZ. The decay is algebraic. And many people believe that an algebraic decay means that we have a gapless, a gapless quantum spin limit. Okay, so that's the conclusion that we arrived in this limit of the phase diagram. Now, if we go to the other limit, then the things start to be uh, different. Again, we run different types of algorithms and compare with other with other types of solutions. And what we see is the one that is working better. Again, is the same technique than before. And it's actually the extrapolation is pretty much compatible with this line here, okay, which corresponds to the numbers uh, from a nematic phase that was found using DMRZ, 
it's a calculation by Cecile Repelant, who is in France uh, from, to, from 2017. Okay, it's a particular type of phase of matter. Here, the people have been proposing many different types of ground states. Our calculation was compatible with this one, and it's actually the one that is proposing lowest uh, lower ground state energies. Okay. The type of phase of matter that we find is this one. There is some type of, of lattice pneumatic uh, structure here, okay, where we have these strong bonds in one direction and then some weak bonds right there. It's a state that preserves the translational symmetry, but it's actually breaking the rotational symmetry. And this was in perfect agreement with these DMRC, these DMRC results. Now, we also found a phase transition around 0.05. We saw this uh, using a variety of, of uh, numerical indicators, the correlation functions, also entanglement entropies, and so on. We saw that there was a discontinuity. So the quantum phase transition, so the phase transition is right here. So there is a very large quantum spin liquid phase. So that this quantum spin liquid is actually very, very robust. Now, at this point, we still didn't determine whether this was uh, first order or second order or which type of phase transition it was, okay? But what we saw is that in the pneumatic phase, actually the correlation functions are, are critical, okay? And they were critical along the direction of, of the pneumatic chains, just like that. Excellent. So um, that was the first project that I wanted to tell you about. It's a very specific um, example where you can take tensor networks and you can assume that a particular type of tensor network is the ground state that you are gonna have in that Hamiltonian and you use it as a variational ansatz to minimize the energy of the Hamiltonian, okay? Now, let me move on to quantum computing and portfolio, and portfolio optimization, okay? As you know, there has been a quantum computing big bang for those of you that were yesterday in this talk uh, uh, at the Camera de Comercio right here. So right now, there are many different proposals for building a quantum computer. IBM says that has 127 qubits. Uh, Rigetti, which is another company, says that they have 80 qubits and so on. There are many different types of architectures superconducting qubits. I think this one is from Google, this picture. Photonic, also, there are photonic chips. This, a, this is the photonic chip by Shanadu, which is uh, a company in Canada that is building uh, photonic quantum computers. Ion traps, okay, they go to 50 something qubits, also on a chip, okay, right now. Uh, this is a picture, I think it's from IonQ, okay, which is another company in the US that is building uh, ion trap quantum computers. Rydberg atoms, also, this is the Eiffel Tower, so you can guess that this was in France. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> okay, this is from the French in uh, from Pascal, which is also another another company in Paris that is building a, a Rydberg atom quantum computer. And of course, there are the people from D Wave, who are also based on superconducting qubits, but they are building a machine that is a quantum annealer that is built in purpose for solving optimization problems, and only that. Okay, even though now they are starting to build also universal quantum computers. But, but. That was the that was the idea. So you know we start to have these machines, they get out of the lab and, and they start to we can start using them. Okay. So what do we do with them? Well, we have to do something. No, this is an example, by the way, since um we are just checking the status of the technology. This is a photonic quantum computer. <laughs> okay, it's a chip the uh by it's actually the chip by by Shanadu. Uh they were able to miniaturized in this way, a full quantum optics lab, all right? So this is full of beam splitters and mirrors and everything here. And you can see the, you know, there is a, uh, um, well, at some point you have optical fibers and photons come in and then come out and then they do all the processing right here. It's really amazing that they managed to do it so small. And this particular type of quantum computer works at room temperature. Okay, that's, that's, also, that's also very interesting. Now, <coughs> this is the evolution of the number of qubits until 2019, so this is uh, outdated. Um, well, this is a slide from last year, I should also update it now, but you can see we started in not so long ago, in 1998 with two qubits, five, seven, 12. So, you know, 10 years ago, we were like somewhere around uh, here, we had 20 something qubits. There was a plateau of 50 something. And then I was saying that we had 72. It's actually not true. Uh, with IBM, we have 127 already. Rigetti, which is another company that is building superconducting uh, quantum computers, uh, we have. They, they say they have 80, and they actually went public yesterday. Okay, they. You can see the pictures of Rigetti in, in the Nasdaq and all that. And uh, and as I was telling you, the plans of IBM is to go for 400 qubits this year and 1,000 next year. Okay, 
Didi and talk about the errors. Didi and talk about the errors. And when you ask them about the errors, they also don't reply too much. <laughs> but, uh, but well, well, okay, it's a declaration of principles, okay? This is the processor by IBM today. It's called uh, Eagle. It has 127 qubits. It has actually a three-dimensional structure. And you know, with 127 qubits, even if, if the depth of the quantum circuit that you are doing, it's not, it's not very big. If you can start entangling 127 qubits and they claim that next year we'll be able to entangle 1,000 qubits, well, you're going to start thinking about non-trivial applications here. Okay, so, so we think that there are going to be uh, massive applications, especially in industry, uh, coming in the next five years. The thing is getting serious. This is the, uh, the roadmap um, by IBM. Uh, it was actually shared in the talk by yesterday. You see they started with 27 qubits, 2019. 2020, they had 65, 2021, this is where we are right now, well, as last year, no, 127. But this year, they want to release this processor of 433 qubits. That's, that's, already, that's already a lot, okay? But the plan is to go next year for 1,121, and then whatever come ne comes next, okay? So you see, this is a very aggressive plan by IBM. I have to say that so far, they have been really fulfilling what they were saying. So, but yeah, but they don't talk about the errors. So <laughs> that's something that it's it's our task to actually to actually characterize it. What can you do with current quantum computers? Because the typical question that you get is, well, you know, but uh, quantum computing, you know, all these processors, they are small, they are noisy, and you cannot really build something useful with that. Uh, they say, no, you cannot run shorts algorithm here to hack all the cybersecurity of the wall because for that you need 1 million qubits and they are not error corrected and you need fault tolerance. And yeah, all that is true. But, but the point is that with these processors, okay, if you have 127 qubits, well, you, you can start doing things, okay? Maybe you cannot, uh, you know, uh, break all the cybersecurity of the wall, but probably you can find other applications that are already quite useful, okay? And this is very well summarized in this, in this quadrant from Gartner, you know, Gartner is one of these consultancy companies where you have different quantum algorithms, right? And the horizontal axis is what they think is the time to market, okay? How long are we gonna have to wait until we can actually run this? No. And the vertical axis is the impact. And of course, if you want to factor, this is kind of a long-term application. It's very to the right, short algorithm, but there are some applications that are gonna come sooner. Okay, and, and there are two that I think that are very important. The first one is quantum optimization, and the second one, well, here it says support vector machines, but it's everything that has to do with artificial intelligence. Okay, essentially what the people call quantum machine learning. You can train a quantum computer to distinguish cats from dogs, okay, in the same way that you can also train a neural network. Okay, and it turns out that a quantum computer can do it much more efficiently and with more accuracy than, than a classical neural network, all right? For those two types of applications, they are, you know, it turns out that the algorithms are actually kind of built for the processors that we have now, that they are bumpy, they are not error corrected, but the, algorithm, the algorithms are also kind of heuristic. There is some optimization involved. And then, you know, it works, it works. Actually, there was a claim um, before Christmas of, there was a claim on quantum supremacy by Google and Amazon, the two teams, and actually John, there was a paper actually signed by John Preskill, who is you know uh, one of the founders of, of the field, uh, claiming that with the Google quantum processor, they were able to solve a problem of anomaly detection, okay? That they couldn't solve using deep, the best deep learning techniques that they had at Google, okay? And well, you know, uh, that was Google, okay? <laughs> that was not a neural network that they programmed in a weekend. Okay, so that probably means that, that yeah, there is, there is something going on there. Now, typical example uh, of uh, quantum application in finance is something called dynamic portfolio optimization. This is the problem of finding the optimal composition of a portfolio of, of assets, okay? Now, imagine that, that you, you want to, um, you want to, you know, imagine that you have a pension plan, okay? And then in this pension plan, uh, you, know, you don't know what is going on, but the guys at the bank, they promise you that they are investing in the best, your money in, this, in the best way so that in 20 years or 30 years, or, or I don't know when, when you wish to retire, so you will maximize your, your returns and you will maximize your profits, okay? Well, mathematically, this is an intractable problem. So you can go to the guy at the bank and tell him that you or her, no, that you don't believe <laughs> that you don't believe that. No, it's one of those intractable problems that is is actually empty hard. Okay, 
So all the solutions that we know for, for that particular type of problem, they, they are suboptimal, okay? People right now use genetic algorithms, they use other type of optimization techniques. You can also solve it with quantum computers, and, and that's actually what, what we did. There is a way of making it uh, mathematical. You can define returns, okay, in this way, where you have some weights for the different assets, and you have some forecasted profits. This is data that you can get. Uh, it's public, actually. This you can get it from, from tables, okay? There is a way of measuring also the risk, in finance, which is actually the covariance of the trajectory, which measures the fluctuations, okay? And now you have constraints, for instance, that you cannot invest more than a given fixed amount of, of money, that the maximum investment per asset has also a cutoff, and so on. You have different constraints. You can put all this in a cost function, all right? You have to minimize, you have to minimize this term, which is minus the returns, a term for the risk, then there is another term, for instance, for transaction cost. Then you can include constraints via Lagrange multipliers. You have a full classical cost function to minimize. But look, this is nothing but a classical Hamiltonian. Okay? This is nothing but a classical Hamiltonian. You can actually discretize it in terms of bits. And when you what you find at the end of the day is what the people in computer science call a quadratic and constrained binary optimization problem. Okay? It's a problem that is. Uh, defined in terms of bit variables, they can be either be zero or one, and it's a quadratic polynomial, it's quadratic in the variables, okay? Or if you want to express it in terms of icing spins, it's an icing magnet. It's the classical icing model, okay, that you have to solve. You have to find the ground state of a particular case of the classical icing model with some couplings that at the end of the day, they will depend on the actual problem that you have. But this is a problem that we are solving. We are solving the icing, the icing, the icing model. Okay, that's it. And this is empty hard. We cannot solve this efficiently with any known classical algorithm. Now, we did some research on solving this problem with quantum computers, okay, in particular with D-Wave. Uh, we did two or three papers with BBBA. We did it also with Bankia originally, that now is Kasha Bank. Also, <coughs> with, well, this was also with Bankia, but it was about uh, data from a st a standard and poor 500. And we actually saw that using uh, quantum annealing, which is the processor uh, that D-Wave is commercializing, uh, and actually not just using quantum annealing, but using a solution that is called hybrid quantum annealing that uh, you know mixes a part of classical processing and quantum processing, so that you can fit very large problems in, in, in the you know in the in the solver. Uh, we were actually able to to solve this problem for for real data for real data, okay? For many, for instance, in this case, for BBBA, we did 52 assets over eight years. And uh, right here for Kashabank, we did 50 assets over a one year period. Here we did the full SP500, which are the 500 largest companies in the US, how the prices are fluctuating, how do you have to invest in them? So this we could do with, with hybrid quantum money, okay? This is, oh, this is an example of the type of results that we were getting. Uh, it's a summary of, of the results actually. So it's one of these points is a portfolio, okay? It's a product that the banks come and sell you, okay? And um, there is something called the, well, in this plot, actually, here you have the risk, okay, which is the volatility. Here you have the returns, which is the profit. And of course, you want to be very high in the vertical axis and very much to the left in the, in the horizontal one, no? This is a random cloud of points, of portfolios. Now, the products, this is for real data from 2019, actually. Products by well-known banks here in Spain, and I don't, I, I'm not going to say which ones, okay, are actually here, okay? If you compute in this plot, they actually fall in here. You can see that they were not much better than a random solution, or than the best random solution, okay? And now if you go with a quantum computer, look at the past and try to optimize the portfolio and see how well they should have been doing, then you get this, okay? This is something that in, in portfolio theory is called the efficient frontier that tells you the best portfolio that you can have that maximizes the return for a given risk profile, okay? So you can see, um, using quantum computers in principle, we believe that they should have been able to get much better much better solutions. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, banks are starting to get interested into, into this technology also. This is an example of portfolio. I will not go into that. D-Wave was very happy about this. They did a highlight. You can also take a look. This is how the type of compositions that you have, we, we are able actually to, you know, to put constraints to divide it in terms of, of different sectors, well, that's it. Now, let me go in the last, uh, Esa, how much time do we have? Does it mean 
five and ten. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. <laughs> let me let me move on to the third to the third uh, topic, which are exotic explorations, because here I want to explain you a very a very nice application of of spin systems that we found. And I want to tell you the story about this. So, so this was three years ago, and I think Mikkel Sanz was visiting here. Okay, Mikkel Sanz is from 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 the group on quantum technologies in Bilbao, and we went for lunch with Gesa. And, uh, and we were not very far from here, and we were chatting about uh, some paper that I had written some time ago on predicting financial crashes, and I don't know what. And then the, the TV was on, and it was the, the basket elections, okay? So Urkuyu was there, and there were all these politicians, and then we just started making fun, saying, hey, can you, can, can, we, can, we, can we make a quantum algorithm for predicting the elections? No? It was like, ha, ha, he, he, ha, ha, yeah, yeah, but it, it, it stayed there. And we, we just, and then we came back and I just, uh, and we stayed for one or two months actually thinking, can, can we do this? No. And, and, and the answer is yes, we can do it. We can do it. No. And, uh, <coughs> and we, we did a, a, an algorithm. We actually mapped the problem of political forecasting to finding the ground state of a spin system. Which is which is kind of, of interesting. Then you realize that what you did is actually much more general. It's an algorithm for predicting trends of of in in, in social networks. No, but you know it's it's finding ground states once once again. This is the main idea. Your opinion is nothing but a spin. Okay, it can point up or it can point down, and then you can define a spin in terms of something called a political compass. Okay, you can be very much to the right, or you can be very much to the left. And this is nothing but an arrow that is a, you know, it's characterized by an angle. This is a classical spin in two dimensions with you one symmetry and all that, no? And if you are on one side, you know, you are gonna vote for Trump and then the other you prefer uh, Che Guevara, all right? Yeah. How you can put two spins? And depending on, on whether you tend to agree, okay? If you agree, you tend to be parallel, all right? You know, two spins is two people. So for instance, if I agree with Aaron, we, we have parallel spins, okay? Depending on our opinions and so on. But that's a ferromagnetic interaction. And if we disagree, we're anti-ferromagnetic, okay? Just like that. So nothing too special, but the point is that if you, you know, if you modelize things like that with data from social media, let's say Twitter, for instance, you can actually build a Hamiltonian, okay? And this is what we realize. You can just build a Hamiltonian of all the interactions among different people, okay? And they tend to agree or disagree, okay? Depending on, on, you know, on, for instance, how much mutual likes they have on, on Twitter or on Facebook and so on, okay? So the more they usually tend to agree, the more ferromagnetic the interaction will be, the more they disagree, the more anti-ferromagnetic. You can put everybody there and you have a huge strongly correlated system, okay? In terms of speeds, right? You can even put penalties. You can put, put pre-condition opinions. So, you know, all the people from a political party, it's pretty clear what they are gonna vote, let's say, you know? Penalties, you can put rewards. Essentially, any type of constraint, you can put it in the Hamiltonian, okay? And we call this the political Hamiltonian, <laughs> okay? Now, the ground state of this guy is arguably the most likely outcome of, of an election. Now, we are talking about elections, but this is much more general, okay? This was the example that triggered the, the idea, no? But actually, this is, you know, this, is, this was our idea. Now, how do you build a Hamiltonian? Well, you build it from data uh, in social networks. You can harvest data from Twitter, that's for free, okay? And then that's what we did, we did an experiment. So we looked for 10, uh, I'm a theoretician, but I actually did a social experiment, okay? And then when I, when I had to submit this paper, I had to see, I had to say if I, you know, have you been making experiments with humans and so on? <laughs> and then I had to say, no, 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 it's not, not at all. <laughs> But no, no, we take we took 10 volunteers, you know, 10 friends that they have Twitter accounts. We had a look at the latest mutual 200 likes, retweets, and comments. And then we we just built the network. Okay. We just built the, the network of interactions. It looked like that. And uh, and then we asked them questions that were referendum-like questions. So yes or no. Do you like a Spiderman or Superman? Or do you like this type of things, chicken breast or leg, or black or white? No. And we had like a full spectrum of questions. Now, from this data, we built the Hamiltonian. It was a classic lysing model. We actually built all the couplings and so on. And, and guess what? It actually, it actually worked, okay? We were actually able, just by fixing the opinions of one or two people in essentially all the questions, we were able to guess the answers of all the others, okay? With a very good accuracy, okay? So in some cases, it was 50, mean, 70, sometimes even 90%, yeah? What do you mean with fixing the opinion? 
So we had to put some initial, some boundary condition, okay? Because otherwise the ground state was very degenerate. And we had to say, okay, this guy, uh, you know, prefers Superman, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you fix the spin for that guy. Mm -hmm. And then you compute the ground state. And it goes exactly to the opinions. 90% of the opinions that you get are correct. Yeah. But you have to put some, some boundary condition, let's say. You have to fix some. Your some social network, that was some friend of yours? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like all, all of them agreed, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all of them agreed, yeah. And we share the results of experiments with them. And it's very curious because there was, uh, there is one case here. It's 89%. It's actually, it's, it was actually a chicken breast or leg question. Okay, and, and we identified the influencer. Okay, so just by you know fixing the pin, there is there was one guy that was influencing the whole network, and uh, <laughs> and we said yeah yeah. But you see, this is a spin system. Eh? This is a spin system. Now this is this looks like a funny thing, but it actually has some very deep implication because the, you know this is an algorithm for identifying influencers for doing trend de detection in, in networks. Okay, you can make this as complicated as you want. You can also use this to detect fake news, okay? To detect, uh, well, essentially for doing artificial intelligence, for learning and predicting, uh, you know, behaviors of very complex networks, okay? Here we're just making fun about politics, but, but you know, this is a very deep uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, idea, okay? And then on top of this, this is a classical Hamiltonian. Uh, it's MP hard. If you want to find the ground state using quantum computers, then you are in a different business. If you want to compute the ground state using tensor networks, you are in another different business, okay? So we think that there is a lot of potential here. Uh, we actually got the paper published uh, this year with Mikkel, and uh, and yeah, and we were actually very happy because this was one of those crazy ideas that you never think about. But, that, but actually, you know, it has implications in the other two fields that I was explaining you before, okay? Good, so with this, I would like to, to finish, and uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and if you have questions, I, I'll be very happy to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will stay here to have a view also on the chat online. So You're the host, yes. Yeah. <laughs> here and then also uh, online questions. Yeah. Um, David. Um, yeah, I, I could imagine that predicting actual elections is much more complex and complicated yes. than yeah. just a chicken. And because you have 40 million spins. Yeah. In yeah, not, not, only, not, <laughs> not only because of this, but but um, because uh, the, well, it's maybe a referendum is an easy application or because yeah. it's just yes or no, maybe, yeah. you know, but uh, political parties and the, it's more complex than just left yes. and right look here. In the no, this, this was a minimal example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, yes, no question, but you can complicate it as much as you want. You have many parties, many different opinions, okay. and you can play with multidimensional spins. And, yeah, so yeah. that was my question. So how would you generalize this? No, the, well, I mean, the, if, a much more complex landscape. Yeah, like, if you have uh, different parties, then, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 in, in, you should play with the angle, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you have different different options in this in this compass. Uh, if there are there may be even orthogonal options depending on on what what they are voting, no. Yeah. Um, then th there is the problem that of course there are a lot of people, no. And, and then you but but then you can do clustering, which is essentially you can also work with renormalized spins, mm -hmm. okay, for for groups of people, okay, yes. let's say, and then look for data in neighborhoods, in cities, or something like that. Yeah. If you have to put it just like just like that, you will end up with uh, millions of spins and very complicated interactions, and, and that looks hard. Hmm. But you can also play with physics ideas, okay? I mean, in data science, for instance, they do clustering, which is what we call renormalization, okay? Uh, and so on, and then you can simplify them all, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Could you even guess which, uh, which groups actually are not social? <laughs> <laughs> which groups hate each other? Or, uh... No, no, no. Which group are unrepresented? In your Which answer? groups are unrepresented? What do you mean? If, if you are, if you have a target of population, right? I guess the basic assumption is that you have a homogeneous representation of all possible states of the state, right? What if there is a special state that is not represented? Ah, that's true. Can you guess that? Yes, I think so. Yeah, because you, you pulled them. Um, yeah, if there is a special state that is not represented. Huh. Yeah, now here I was assuming that the model was describing all the different options. 
So the people that are not represented, I guess they will just not vote, okay, or, or vote in blank or something like that. And and you could you could model also that in the you could add another direction of the spin, for instance, just for that. Yeah. You have to make some assumptions. Exactly. I have a very uh, naive question. The second part, when you basically talk about this uh, asset, let's say the, the portfolio optimization. So for example, uh, you, 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 you spoke about these uh, large banks that would basically use this uh, uh, technology and so on, but also now is this, I mean, uh, this trend of the passive, uh, let's say investment. Yes. And all these, let's say, robot advisor. This is also this type of uh, technology under yes. the hood. Yes, yes, it's a uh, machine learning. I see machine learning. Yeah. They essentially they well, they have a lot of data. They try to make sense of it, and then they use some probably neural network that tries to predict what's going to be the the best uh, next investment. But, yeah. but these are these are the robot advisors. Yeah. But still, I mean, there is no quantum behind. No, okay. no, it's all classical. No. There are some banks that are starting to, I mean, we've done all these, all these were pilot projects and some, some people are <laughs> starting to think about putting this in production already. Yeah. There was another question. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. There's a very simple question, possibly uh, I'm not an expert as well, but I found this fascinating. Thank you very much. The question is uh, also about the second part, about the optimization. So of course this has been, you know, for the last 80 years, people have always tried to find a pattern, which investments are going to be the next big ones. And you know, the reason why one hasn't taken off, <clears throat> I guess, is that whenever you look at historical data, you can say, you, can, you know the final answer, you can see which one did best. Yeah. And then when you apply it to the future, it generally doesn't work as well. Mm -hmm. Have you, how, so how do you do it then? For, say, you have a kind of a new solution. Yeah. Have you then, do you keep looking? Do you this keep, was, uh, this was for past data. Yes. yes. And, then, and then, exactly. But even for past data, uh, we were able, in some cases, to find better solutions than the classical ones. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. And then you can use those solutions from the past that are already better, for instance, to train an algorithm to predict the future. Yeah. Because if you don't even know what was the optimal solution in the past, how, how are you going to predict the, the optimal for the future? No? So, yeah. Yeah, this is some people are working on that. Uh, and then along similar lines, uh, especially when you, when you look at something like S&P 500, yeah. You know, okay, you have some. Now, I expect that there'd be one or two companies in there that probably shot up a thousand percent a year. Technology, mm -hmm. you know. Because that's, that's, that increases a lot of the risk. So the volatility actually could be, they, they have this constraint that they want to diversify the investment yes. to minimize yeah. risk. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, and that, that's kind of a standard. Yeah. And they want to avoid this, they call these corner solutions. Okay. Yes. Of course, I could just put all my money in Tesla, let's say, you know, but but that's what happens if something happens at Tesla. <laughs> and they, they want to avoid these this type of situations. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um in the in the first part of your talk, uh, you were using uh, well when you were dealing with the antiferromagnet, mm. you, were, you were using the language of phase transition. Yes, uh, which I I was wondering whether you can bring that language into uh, the way you deal with your second and, and third parts of the talk, um, in the sense yeah. that uh, I mean you seem to be using a fairly similar representation for yeah. your problems, mm. but I guess that. Uh, the language of phase transitions could be very interesting when speaking about economics. Maybe maybe uh, a range yeah. of conditions is going to take us into crashes or yeah. a very successful situation actually, actually, for society. Actually, you just said it. Uh, uh, there is another project that uh, I think I, I presented it at some point here, but uh, I did not talk about that today, which is about financial crashes. And that's a phase transition. When, when you put it, uh, you can make a Hamiltonian for an economic model and look for the stable configurations of the of the economic network, and that's uh, that's a finding the ground state of a Hamiltonian. And then you can see that the difference between crash and no crash is a first order phase transition. Uh, it's a ferromagnet, uh, anti uh, paramagnet actually. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you know the work of, of Nicholas Christakis, who has been work working on on networks and societies, mm, and social no. network information okay. that, that may be okay. interesting for you. Yeah, okay. Cool. Thank you.
Yeah. I have two questions regarding the second part and the third part of DOC, and they are kind of the similar question, but for example, I want to ask you how a physical model can predict or to which extent uh, can predict the own impact of your own prediction. I mean, for example, if you say that the market uh, is going to evolve this way, and um, this is the way you have to invest or get a vast amount of money, and then everyone starts investing in that, uh, how your model is going to predict that. And in the second part, and um, for the third part, sorry, how uh, physically, how do you treat the noise in a sense? Like, how uh, do you treat um, that people know that they are being checked or that the prediction is going to impact their own uh, behavior yes. of people or yeah. how people uh, behave uh, evil in an evil way, like Russian elections or... Yes. So, so for the second equation is about how so how can you predict the impact of your own investment in the investment? No? Yeah, this can this can it's, it's you can include it in the for instance in portfolio optimization. You can include it with an extra term that is called market impact that I didn't that I didn't put it here. But you can put an extra term in the cost function actually. That if you of course if you make a very big investment that's shaking the market <laughs> by itself. Okay, and you can you can also put it as a term in the cost function. Yeah. It's called the market impact, yeah, and that, but that's only for very big movements. Uh, I mean, we see that in cryptocurrencies, for instance, no, you see these whales, they call it, no, that they just move uh, millions in euros in bitcoins and so on, and they just shake the market up and down. You, you can you can put it as a term in the cost function. And in the in the Hamiltonian of the third part, that's a good question. We we didn't think about that, but um, but uh, well. I'm pretty sure it's possible to, to take it into account. Yeah, but uh, we still need to figure out how, how to do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, concerning the first part of the breaking column uh, you uh, predict in a continuous spin liquid phase. Yes. Uh, it's a topological continuous spin liquid phase, right? It's a topological, yeah. So this kind of phase have the, you, you say you, the, you measure the energy uh, a variation with the bond in the bond dimensions, yes. the, the, the key algebra, algebra thing, right? Yes. So uh, for, for this kind of phase, which kind of uh, operator we can use to, to, to determine these phases is a quantum spin phase or not? Maybe you can, if you use the PEPS, the PEPS code, you can measure the, the kilo edge modes for this, this problem or something. Uh... Like yeah, you can also measure the, but we didn't do. You could measure the topological entanglement entropy, for instance. Okay, which uh, it's a correction of the entanglement entropy of a block, and that's an indicator of whether you are in a topological phase or not. Okay, oh. with that we didn't compute, uh, and it's actually easier than computing chiral. Well, actually, you, I, if you try to compute chiral edge modes, you would, and this was, this phase was not chiral; it was topological but non-chiral. Okay? Oh, okay. Yeah. But you could compute the topological entanglement entropy. Okay. Yeah, there is one. question is related to one of the questions before. So, um, so you are using methods of stack mate, right, to model the market. Yeah. So, so I guess the basic assumption is that the market are at the equilibrium. Uh, yes. But they are not at the equilibrium. Right. <laughs> That's a big question in economics. Yeah. There are many models actually for doing for, for, for doing portfolio optimization and so on. Yeah. This one that I presented here is called modern portfolio theory. There is something called Markovich portfolio optimization. That, that's the one that I that I did here. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, yeah, you are absolutely right. Yeah. You have played it before in the in the online. So they are welcome to also ask questions, post them. I haven't seen any, but please. Take advantage of it. Can I ask another one? Um, yeah, so another thing, like more methodological, is that you were finding interesting solutions by looking at, at ground states, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken. But are you are you leaving entropy uh, aside completely? So for example, yes. when you're finding your solution for the for the antiferromagnet, you seem to be going for the lowest energy states. Uh, I guess that entropy matters as well, right? I, I, it definitely does in a nice model. No, but uh, here we are at zero temperature. Sure, but uh, 
is is that interesting maybe for like a broader range of problems? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, going to finite temperature properties for sure, and then, and then you have to deal with uh, thermal states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But here we were at zero temperature because this problem was defined at zero temperature because at zero temperature is when you have quantum phase transitions. Because, because th those are the phase transitions that are only driven by, by quantum fluctuations because you don't have temperature, okay? Yeah, but, uh, and then that's the reason why we're only focusing on the energy, okay? Uh, and therefore we can use variational methods and so on and so forth. But as soon as you switch on the temperature, uh, yeah, yeah, then you have to do mixed states, uh, thermal states and so on, and you have to take that into account. Yeah. So we have one online question. Um, Hello, you can... Can I read it? Yeah. Okay, maybe I, maybe I read it. So, Dorcia, I still have a question. Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? Oh, yeah, we got here. <laughs> He's got talking. Or... <laughs> Hello, Romain. Uh, yeah. First of all, thanks for the seminar. I think it was very interesting. I have just two small questions. The first one was, uh, you mentioned some project about finances, energy. Uh, you mentioned it, maybe it's precarious for cybersecurity because there is still a small number of qubits. But do you think it could be implemented in other scopes, like, for example, health for accelerating di diagnosis, personalizing ah. medicines, or absolutely yes, even drugs or vaccines discoveries? Yes. Or is yes. it still early? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. So for cybersecurity, maybe it's uh, now too early, but uh, I don't know where to look, maybe at the camera. <laughs> but, uh, but for uh, problems related to artificial intelligence, uh, yes, yes, absolutely, one can, one can start applying the quantum... I mean, it's, it's the, what, I, what I said of this paper from the Google and, and Amazon teams, that they, they found that for a problem of anomaly detection, which is nothing but, you know, a machine learning algorithm, with their quantum processor, they were more more precise than with the uh, with deep learning. So, of course, you can use this to, uh, you know, for um, um, for other essentially whatever you have a machine learning problem, okay, and and that's going to be of course very useful in health and so on in detecting uh, patterns in the uh, scanning images and detecting tumors and so on. These are the typical machine learning problems where you have many images and you have to recognize something there. Yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, we recently saw like some hardware that uh, accelerated the computation with uh, low power, with uh, some EI in the chip. So do you use something to accelerate the computation in your enterprise for the algorithms? Uh, you mean for the quantum algorithms or for the tensor networks? For the quantum, for example. Ah. Uh, no, no, we don't, but, but we could. We, we don't use any special interface to accelerate it. Okay. Mm. Okay. Good. It, it was fun hearing a question. <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey. Um, well, you were talking about uh, the all these new quantum computers and, and all the advantages that we can bring. Do you think that it's in, inevitable that they will take over in all these areas or and it's just a matter of time? Well, that's there, a like, tough question. <laughs> <laughs> I think so, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a matter of time. It's a matter, I mean, that doesn't mean that we are going to stop using classical computers. Of course, we are going to keep using them uh, because they work great no, for most of the things that we do. But the only thing is that for some very specific problems for which you know classical CPUs just take a lot of time and classical algorithms, we will probably <coughs> connect on, on the cloud to some other quantum server and solve it there. Yeah. There's no like fundamental problem to be solved. Mm, so far, we didn't find anything. I mean, there was this issue of whether uh, this is why these claims on quantum supremacy are, are important because there was this issue of well, maybe there is something fundamental in nature that forbids us to to actually be faster be faster than classical, but so far we didn't find anything. And, and that was the, these claims in quantum supremacy, this is what they seem to, to claim, okay? Even though these claims are very, you know, the first claims on quantum supremacy by Google, they are already outdated, okay? And this is an interesting story. So Google claimed quantum supremacy in 2019, okay? And nowadays uh, that's outdated because there was a Chinese group that last year that simulated it with tensor networks. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. actually we're using a very clever algorithm, but now there are 
couple of other claims and it, there is a race no so the quantum is pushing and that's motivating better classical algorithms and, and let's see where where they start to diverge yeah Okay. Uh, no more questions here. No, in the chat, and uh, let's thank you again. Thank you. Two weeks. Okay, so two weeks. Uh, two weeks. Uh, two weeks. La pregunta online ha sido divertida. La pregunta online parece que te the whole open society you now. We are coming back to a little more open society now. We can have kind of uh, yes, yes, seminars yes. in person. And so. Oh, you got it yeah. earlier. Yes, no. thanks. How many, how many people were in the last month? Yeah. Yeah. The first month or half years. Yeah. On the whole, especially in the north. I mean, no, 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 no,